Chapter 3 Topics Samuel attends Yale College Dietary Troubles Death of his brother George Leaves college in ill health Advice for Van Buren Enters New York University Leggett in the Plain Dealer newspaper Financial Crisis of 1836 through 1837 Marcy and Tilden begin to diverge Tilden's reply to Marshall The Independent Treasury Prepares the address of the mechanics and workingmen It was ultimately decided that young Tilden should be sent to Yale College He matriculated there in June, 1834 and in the last quarter of the freshman year, among his classmates, 60 in number, we find the now well-known names of the late Chief Justice Waite, William M. of Arts, Edwards Pierpont, and Benjamin Stillman. It was not, however, in the order of providence that that venerable seat of learning, upon which one of his kindred had conferred his name and yet more substantial benefactions, was to have the honor of seeing Tilden's name enrolled among her graduates. The diet, the climate, and the confinement affected him so unfavorably that, when he went home for the Christmas holidays, he was so completely broken down in health that it was decided he should not return. Two or three of his letters to his father during his connection with Yale College have been preserved, which possess a certain interest less for the light they throw upon the educational advantages he enjoyed there than upon the material difficulties which he encountered and the very characteristic manner in which he contended with them. On the 6th of June, 1834, and only a few days after his arrival at the college, he writes to his father, I am nearly convinced that I shall be obliged to give up boarding at Commons. I have had two days' experience and will give you our bill of fare. Day before yesterday morning we had a dish of meat, very fresh bread and butter, coffee, and nothing else whatever. At dinner, boiled shad and potatoes, fresh bread and butter and rice pudding, enough for those who could eat such things. At tea, fresh bread and butter and cheese and some molasses cake, which, by the by, comes only occasionally. The next morning, shad and potatoes and fresh bread and butter again. Either of these articles I could sometimes eat, but could not do it constantly. I have not been as well as common for a few days, and when I study, it is necessary to diet with more care than when engaged in other employments, or in nothing. The bread has been uniformly newly baked, and, as I think of all the New Haven bread I have seen, slackly baked, and yesterday it was scarcely cold and I could procure no other. I shall see today what I can do, and unless I can be assured of well done and stale bread shall board with Mr. Goodman. Perhaps it is best to do so at once. The butter is pretty good. Footnote. Tilden did not reside in the college buildings, but had lodgings in the house of a Mr. Gardner, below the Taunton, in a street at right angles with the front of the college buildings. At first he took his meals at the commons, but finding the diet unsuited to his delicate stomach he soon made different arrangements. End of footnote. One cannot help inferring from this criticism of the Yale Commons menu of that day that the dietary which would have suited Tilden would not have been popular with many of his comrades. On the 13th of June he writes again that he has left commons and that his health is decidedly better and improving. On the 30th of June he writes that his health had recovered from the shock it had received when he first arrived there, and that he proposed to indulge himself in a few horseback rides. He hints that it would be too expensive to continue long. His devotion to the college curriculum did not prevent his keeping a strict reconing of all the misdeeds of the Whig senators at Washington, nor from conning faithfully the columns of the Albany Argus whenever he could induce the family to remember to send it to him. In 1834, the Senate rejected President Jackson's nomination of Stevenson, of Virginia, as minister to England. I cannot see what motive, wrote Tilden, save the most unaccountable malignity, could have brought the Senate to the act. 
what will be the effect in Virginia. On the 3rd of July, he writes his father, My health rather improves, and if it be possible, must improve more, for the embarrassments of broken health and the situation in which I am are indescribable. Seven weeks will be quickly gone, and I say what I am not at all lapped to do the sooner the better. While he was at New Haven, he received the news of the death of his brother George, who was three years his junior. In a letter from Samuel to his father on the subject, there is the following inscription for his brother's tomb, presumably written by him, in memory of George Frederick Tilden, son of a lamb and Polly Tilden, who died July 12, 1835, aged 18 years, six months, and six days. This monument is erected by him who best knew his virtues and affectionately cherishes a recollection of them. In his anticipations of improved health, he was disappointed. So far from improving, when he returned to his family at the close of the term, his condition was alarming. He tried horseback riding, but without any decided advantage. His father weighed him one day, and again ten days later. He had lost seven pounds in the interval. His father turned pale, but made no remarks that his emaciation at this time must have been such as to justify his father's alarm is confirmed by the following humorous paragraph with which Samuel concludes a letter written to his father soon after his return to New York. Our Hudson Taylors took the Dr. Young Love's directions to make my pantaloons on his broomsticks quite literally, so that I shall send them back to be let out. Let Moses write them not to make my thin ones so tight. A few days later, his father took him out riding and availed himself of the occasion to intimate a doubt of the wisdom of his returning to New Haven. After what we may be sure was an exhaustive discussion of the question, it was finally decided that he should not return, but should go to New York and enter the university, then recently opened, at the approaching January term. In the interval, we do not find the condition of his health abated his interest in politics nor weakened his sense of personal responsibility for what was done at Washington. Writing as usual to his father, he says, I wish you would write to Van Buren urging him to impress as much as he can upon the president the necessity of avoiding everything that may seem violent or high-handed. To pursue the contrary course is to give to his opponents a decided advantage, and in fact to do just what they who are plotting his ruin wish him to do. It is understood that he will not adjourn the Senate if they sit till the 4th of March. One other step of prudence is necessary. Let him respect their negative upon appointments, and if they reject one nomination, make another. They have the unquestionable right to reject upon whatever appears to them sufficient cause. If they abuse their powers by refusing concurrence in the appointment of government directors on the ground of their being spies, it is both proper and prudent for him to submit to it. Besides, moderation on his part will place them in the wrong with the nation. If they reject good and true men, if they refuse appropriations, though it must be regretted as disgraceful to the country, it will be fatal to them. I learned privately that the type, press, etc., of the standard were sold today at auction and purchased by Dr. Horton. Tonight will decide whether the paper appears on Monday morning. The anti Masons still maintained a formidable organization in many of the states and had to be reconed within all speculations about the succession to the presidency. They were mostly Whigs and, one day, might hold the balance of power in the country. To divide them or to detach a sufficient number to neutralize their influence, at least in the state of New York, was regarded as indispensable to the success of Mr. Van Buren's candidature in 1837. Some light is thrown upon the methods discussed to the end in a letter to his father dated New York, February 14, 1835. In this letter he refers particularly to the suggestion of a Mr. W. It is not thought necessary, or even desirable, that he should profess himself an anti-Mason. It is considered sufficient that he should express in conversation a general disapproval of secret societies, 
a sentiment which Mr. Ian Buren, in common with the mass of the community, is supposed to entertain. Such is the attitude of Judge McLean, Mr. Calhoun, and Mr. Webster. The two latter, certainly, have written nothing, but are understood to entertain and express verbally a disapprobation of masonry. Thus, while they avoid the hostility of any who may yet adhere to the fraternity and the odium of courting anti-masonry, they are regarded by the anti-masons as fairly included among those from whom that party can consistently select their candidate. It is perhaps well to mention here that before the assembling of the Anti-Masonic National Convention in December next, the National Convention Committee will probably address a circular to each of the presidential candidates, soliciting their sentiments in regard to anti-masonry. Mr. W. thinks that, against Mr. Calhoun, Judge White, Judge McLean, or any other man save perhaps Mr. Webster, Mr. Van Buren would have a fair prospect of obtaining the anti-Masonic nomination, at any rate, that an important diversion in his favor would be made. In this state, the class I have already described are well disposed towards Mr. Van Buren. It includes the principal anti-Masons of this city ward, Cothiel, Townshend, I believe, etc. Albert H. Tracy also is understood to be friendly to Mr. Van Buren although he will avoid separating from the party. I must confess, however, that I can see very little to hope from the anti-Masons of this state as a party. Nearly all their leaders, all their presses are against us. The whole machinery of party organization is in the hands of the opposition. Even those of them who were formerly Republican have so long acted with the opposition have been so long under the influence of federal leaders and have so long received their political information through channels artfully calculated to bias and gradually prepare them for a thorough amalgamation with their old opponents that they are alienated from their democratic friends. Our only hope, it seems to me, is from their rank and file. Even if it were possible to procure the anti-Masonic nomination, I should be afraid of it. Anything which could be tortured to bear the appearance of tampering or coalescing with them would be extremely hazardous. An informal support or a diversion from them would avoid this danger, and, in many possible contingencies, might be of the utmost importance. It is worthy of serious consideration whether something might not be done to promote so desirable an object. This view of the subject invests, in my mind, Mr. O's suggestions with an interest and a consequence which they might not possess in themselves. If by any means the anti-Masons could be made to regard Mr. Van Buren as unobjectionable on the score of anti-Masonry, it could not fail greatly to facilitate and increase accessions from their ranks, even though they should have a candidate in the field. If, in any case, anything else than a verbal expression of opinion should be thought best, it would probably be regarded as most eligible to give that expression the form of a reply to a circular of the Anti-Masonic Committee addressed to all the presidential candidates a course which would remove all appearances of collusion and give to the transaction the most favorable aspect. Mr. W. thinks there is a very slight probability of Judge McLean being a candidate. The judge feels, with all its force, the necessity of resigning his present station as a preliminary step. He regards it as indispensable and expresses a determination not to do so and consequently not to be a candidate unless the opposition will unite upon him. This was the cause of his declining the anti-Masonic nomination in 1832, which was made, I believe, through Mr. W., and he yet adheres to the determination he then acted upon. I suppose he keeps steadily in view the old adage about a bird in the hand. He is as crafty as he can be. Of Tilden's residence at the university there is little to be said. His health was so uncertain that his connection as an undergraduate with that institution, as with Yale, was more nominal than real. He entered at the commencement of the year 1835 
and in the spring of the following year we find him planning to leave the university and travel in quest of the health which he had sought in vain from Empiris, apothecaries, and drugs. His sister Henrietta's health was also at this time a subject of family solicitude. What little we do know of his university career must be gathered mainly from his letters. On the 11th of April, 1836, he writes, I have been thinking of a tour south, and still more of a voyage across the ocean the former might do some good, but I am inclined to regard the latter as the really wise course, if we could all think so. I did not know but your own health would be benefited by a journey of a week or two. As to Moses' proposition to go to Washington if he can get away from home, very well. Under all the circumstances I suppose that doubtful, though I should be pleased to see what is to be seen there, I am not very solicitous on that account. If I could accomplish what is more important to me, I would make almost any sacrifice to do it. My present impression is that it will not be best for me to return home this spring I may write the reasons. Some five weeks later he recurs to the travel cure. Under all the circumstances, considering especially that I have been so long absent from the university, and shall, if I return, remain there so short a time, I hesitate to resume my studies there this spring, and am strongly inclined to give them up altogether and put myself in immediate readiness to make a tour with you, if you can so arrange your business as to allow your absence. I cannot have the operation on my teeth completed, and my other arrangements made to leave, in less than one or two weeks, in one week from the receipt of your answer, or at any time after, which will suit your convenience. I would like to accompany you to Washington, spend a few days there, go west as far as Mr. Madison's, then see there across the Algenies or directly to Pittsburgh, and return by the Pennsylvania line of internal improvements. You have long desired to see Mr. Madison and there is little probability that the power of doing so will long remain. For, though now in the vigor and fullness of his faculties, his life must soon draw to a close. Congress, it is understood, will continue in session until the 20th of June or 1st of July. The last week but one of the session would perhaps be as good a time as can be selected to be there. Perhaps you might do something for Aaron in Baltimore. Washington, and Richmond, if you prefer it, we could vary the route so as to return to Philadelphia and go thence to Pittsburgh, and home through our own state. Though if it be not laying out too long and expensive journeys, I should like to make that a separate tour. A voyage to Nantucket does not strike me very favorably would it not be long enough to derange and disturb the functions of the system, without producing a decided and permanent change of its action. And should I not thus incur the evils of a sea voyage, without a reasonable prospect of reaping its benefits? I do not care to go to Monticello, or if I do, to remain there many days. Visiting is not in harmony with my feelings I prefer to be an ions, strangers or at home. His correspondence furnishes no evidence that Mr. Tilden executed the plan of travel about which he wrote so much to his father in 1836. The fact that their most distinguished neighbor and friend was a candidate for the presidency, and was in the fall of that year elected to that dignity, establishes a strong presumption that he did not leave the state pending a contest of only less personal interest to the Tilden family than that in which he himself bore the same standard in 1876. Tilden to his father. New York, December 12, 1836. Monday, 2 p.m. My dear father, I should have sent you the President's message had I not supposed what the result has shown to be true that you would receive it earlier by the Argus than by any copy I could send. It excited rather less interest than the two last, both from the circumstances of the country which it had occasion to notice, and the disposition, now, becoming prevalent, for quiet. There are frequent and various reports relative to the health of the president, taking their character from the constant mutations of disease and the different channels through which they come. I am on the whole inclined to believe that his condition is very precarious and uncertain. 
His firmness and native vigor of constitution may sustain him some time longer, or he may sink rapidly. I should not be surprised at either result. There is a rumor that his hemorrhage has recurred, and it is contradicted. I scarcely know which to believe. Alabama, Louisiana, Missouri, Arkansas, and Mississippi have all gone for Van Buren, giving him a majority of 43 electoral votes. Considering the game that was played against him, the combination of discordant and powerful factions, the multiplicity of candidates, enlisting in their favor local and sectional interests, artfully calculated to divide and to prevent an election by the people, I must regard such a majority over the whole of them as a more triumphant victory than the receiving two-thirds or three-quarters of all the votes against a single candidate. The opposition bluster and appear to be organizing. The effort is idle. I met Vanderpool a few days after you left. He represented Senator Tracy as saying to the opposition, it is useless to think of preventing a re-election. Let the little devil I don't know but Vanderpool interpolated the oath once get in and you will never get him out. Nick Biddle is out with a second letter and a most extraordinary one it is. I have read it, but hastily as yet. It would not have been strange if, having a public document to prepare, he had incidentally assailed the administration, or even gone somewhat aside to do so. But to volunteer such an attack, and to bring it before the public in such a forced and unnatural mode, as well as the matter itself, indicating governable passion or deep design, I think the latter. Its purpose appears to be to revive, concentrate, and direct the exertions of the opposition, the time, the circumstances, and the manner in which the document was brought out, all show that it is the giving out of the war cry, which is to rally the congressional opposition, and to renimate, in aid of the opposition, the clamor of the merchants and speculators. Mr. Biddle's motive is easily understood he still cherishes the hope of re-establishing the bank and of placing himself again at the head of the financial and commercial affairs of the country. Many of the merchants also entertain the same expectations, but it really surprises me that the large portion of the opposition, which is merely political, should be willing to renew the struggle with Mr. Biddle openly in the field as their leader, and to reopen an issue, which, however well it may suit his purposes, is ominous of anything but success to them but let them have their own way. They always surely work the success of their opponents. Mr. Van Buren assumed the duties of President of the United States on the 4th of March, 1837. In his inaugural address he felt it to be his duty to announce that, should any bill, abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia, receive the approval of Congress, he would be obliged to veto it. William Leggett who had recently commenced the publication of a weekly sheet called The Plain Dealer, who had been one of the ardent supporters of President Jackson's administration and equally earnest in advocating the election of Mr. Van Buren, took exception to this announcement of the new president and made it the pretext for assailing him and his administration with great bitterness. Having been for several years prior to the establishment of The Plain Dealer and associate editor of the Evening Post, where he had won the year and confidence of the Democratic Party. This assault upon the president at the very beginning of his administration surprised and pained not only the president's friends, but no less the friends of Mr. Leggett himself. Mr. Tilden thought the article ought not to be passed over in silence by the friends of the administration, and over the signature of Jackson E. Zamicus, addressed to Mr. Leggett a series of letters which he published in the Times a Democratic paper at that time under the editorial management of Dr. William Holland. It is to this correspondence that reference is made in the following letter. Tilden to his father, New York, March 25, 1837, Saturday, 11 a.m. My dear father, I send you the times containing a castigation I have been administering to the plain dealer. The articles were written on a sudden impulse and offered to the Times a week ago. They were declined, avowedly from no public or party consideration, 
but solely from a personal indisposition to provoke the attacks of the plain dealer. It is just to add that they said, if it were required by important party considerations, they would not shrink from encountering his hostility. I had not a word to say, till I had satisfied myself that I could bring out nothing of the kind in any other paper. I then represented to them the folly and evil consequences, party and personal, of such timidity, and offered to assume all the responsibility of the matter and of conducting any controversy it might excite which, by the way, I don't consider much. After many doubts some of them for the first time on public grounds they consented. I suggested a general disclaimer to appease their fears, but, contrary to their representation, thought it unnecessary and idle. I have mentioned these circumstances merely to note the fact that there is no paper in the city which does not lack the will or the courage to repel an attack of William Leggett upon Martin Van Buren, however gross. The post is doing very well on the whole, but I do not know how far it can be depended on. I believe it is on such terms with Leggett that it would vindicate none of the party, if even its measures, against him. If I had thought any consideration of party policy was opposed to the course I have token, it would have been conclusive, but I did not. Leggett's impracticability and abolitionism, even if he were friendly in feeling, render him more formidable as a friend than as an enemy. To concede to him the character of independence and friendship is but to increase a power which he is constantly using without regard to truth or justice against all the leading men of the party. Chastisement has a better effect upon him than kindness. He has yet a considerable hold on many of the party, and I thought the occasion admirably adapted to break it. If I may be allowed to speak of the effect upon him, I shall say that it has apparently been even better than I expected. In his last number he has avoided noticing me, but has taken occasion, from a single sentence from the Argus, to put in his answering plea. His tone of arrogant, insolent crimination is changed for one of subdued self-justification. He has formally restated his position, but has wholly omitted his main charge, that of apostasy from democratic principles. The quotations which run through all his former articles, but which I showed to be garbled, are no more heard of. On the whole, it is a more complete cognivate than I expected. He has since expressed himself still more unhappily, and, if it is convenient, I shall, in the course of a day or two, avail myself of it. I am intolerably provoked by the insolent superiority which the papers of this city, especially ours, allow him to assume. You will not understand all the allusions. Three of them are Leggett's attacks on Washington Irving, Governor Marcy's fall proclamation, and Judge Hoffman after his death. They are understood here. Though the propriety of a president threatening the national legislature with a veto was open to criticism as an effort to exert an illegitimate influence upon legislation, Leggett's assault was so brutal and reckless in manner and tone that he fell an easy prey to his wary and more deliberate adversary. In the second of Tilden's letters to Leggett there is a character sketch of the I always speak my mind nuisances worthy of the pen of Addison. Having referred to some garbled quotations from the message which Leggett had made, he proceeds. If an enemy had made a series of perversions so forced and of garbling so palpable, do you think it would not have been ascribed to something more intentional than the mere bias of party? And you who have lacerated the feelings of an amiable man for the changing a single word, without injury to the author, and confessedly, with the kindest intentions, bethink you in what terms you would have spoken of another who had made such studied misrepresentations, and then built upon them revolting charges against one, in regard to whom he professed the best feelings and the highest opinions. What indignation, eloquent of scorn and reprobation, would you yourself have visited upon such a man? What, then, has caused such conduct? I fear that the mass of all parties will see in it wrong as outrageous, and treachery as calculating as the pretensions to justice are monstrous, and the professions of friendship are hypocritical with which it is sought at once to conceal the coward design and to add effect to the blow. 
For my part, I will not believe it. I prefer a kinder theory. May there not be an eager desire to signalize one's independence that in its heady course sometimes tramples down consistency, justice, and sincerity. I know that there are difficulties in the theory, but I will try my best to make it plausible. It is unfortunately the case that those who particularly affect a virtue are apt to fall into the corresponding vice. Latin I will translate to English using Google after the verse. Brevis us laboro. Obscurus fio. Sectantum levi inervi. Deficient tanimic. Prosus grandia turgit. Serpit humitudis nimish internatus quiprocella. Qui verir cupit trem prodigiliter anam. Delphinum silvus apingit. Fluctibus aprum. Verse translated. I labor to be short. I become obscure. The nerves and the mind are failing when following smooth things. It swells by declaring great things. He who desires to vary one thing miraculously, paints a dolphin in the woods, a wild boar by the waves. Impartiality and independence also have their counterfeits. I know that there is a class of no party men who vindicate their claim to that character by doing injustice to all, even without the excuse of bias. But to be really impartial and independent, a rare assemblage of mental and moral qualities is requisite. First, a power of just reasoning, with a special freedom from rashness in the induction of general principles, and a confident reliance on their universal and exact truth. Then, a moderation of character which lessens the bias of controversy and saves from false extremes. A freedom from the arrogant pride of personal independence that does not allow of profiting by the opinions of others. And above all, a pervading sense of justice that is cautious to do no wrong. A man who is so unfortunate as to possess the reverse of these qualities is mentally and morally disqualified for genuine impartiality and independence. If he be afflicted with the desire of appearing distinguished for the qualities he most lacks, the disease becomes a mania. He considers it a derogation from his personal character to concede aught to the feelings or opinions of others, forgetting that, without such concession there can be no common action for a common object, and that without the capability of such action, a man is fit, not for society, not even for a state of nature, but only for absolute solitude. Absurdly attempting to act with others, he is not satisfied with devoting himself, as he has a right to do, to the maintenance of his peculiar sentiments, but must force those sentiments upon his associates. Even then he cannot content himself with leading on a change of opinion, the slow progress of which in masses is the she-tanker of safety. He will not give others the opportunity of investigation he has previously had. He makes no allowance for deficient means of information, for habitual moderation, or constitutional caution. Still less does he tolerate dissent, or a qualification of his extremes. All must be convinced wholly and in stander. With eyes closed and throats distended, they must force down his new fangled doctrine with all its sharp points and its impure crudities, under the penalty of being held up to public reprobation and scorn as false to the common object. If he is in any measure successful, he ascribes to his very faults what is due to truth struggling to light through the impracticability of its advocate. Nor does the folly end here. He is an independent man, forsooth. And he must prove it. He must maintain his individuality among his associates even to the injury of the common object. Lest he seem partial to his friends, he inflicts outrage upon them. To avoid the appearance of an amiable weakness, he commits actual injustice and treachery. Boasting his freedom from the least excess of an oval and generous sentiment, he is the slave of an exaggerated idea which springs from a pitiful vanity. Friendship has less influence on his opinions and conduct than opposition. The one cannot moderate or restrain him, but the other can drive him to absurd extremes. He is to his friends an enemy, to his enemies a slave. He is independent of authority, and therefore attacks what is authorized, 
even though it be right. Lai despises the delicacy which alone renders social life tolerable and therefore violates the privacy of retirement and lacerates personal character. He is above regarding what mankind esteem most sacred. He assails the revered usages of religion. His vampire tracks are upon the graves of the dead. All the while he mistakes his own motives. If he had applied the test of common sense, he could not have been deceived. Impartial justice, when forced to condemn, does not exaggerate the fault. When speaking solely from public motives, and through an organ modulated by personal benevolence, its voice is of forbearing censure, not of angry crimination. Impartial justice does not commit palpable and outrageous wrong. If a little adulterated by human frailty, it does not inflict such wrong on friends whom that weakness would naturally favor. He mistakes also the consequences of his conduct. Injustice or even harshness in the judge causes an undue sympathy for the guilty that foils the end of punishment. He mistakes the character in which he acts. He fancies that, as a universal Aristarchus, he rules and writes the world, while he serves it, if at all, as a public flagellator. I have drawn a picture I leave it to the public to say if it be a portrait. After the removal of the government deposits from the United States Bank in 1835 to the state banks, it was generally treated by them, for discount purposes, as a part of their capital. And if it did not cause, it contributed largely to the wild and reckless speculation of 1836 through 1837. Partly to protect the government from loss, and partly to check the speculation craze of the period, President Jackson issued an order that the government land offices should receive nothing but gold and silver or certificates of deposit in specie in payment for land. The government at this time was not only for the first time in its history free from debt, but had a surplus of four zero 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 dollars To the surprise and disgust of the banks who were using this money, Congress ordered it to be distributed among them states. To these grievances many minor causes contributed to produce the memorable Panic of 1837, to which Mr. Tilden makes allusion in a letter to his father dated April 5, 1837. The pressure is but little, if any, mitigated. I saw yesterday a list of about 65 mercantile houses who have either failed or procured extensions. There are undoubtedly many more who have silently and secretly effected accommodations with their creditors. I believe that very few of the land jobbers have pretended for a long time to meet their liabilities. Many very heavy and strong houses have fallen. Among them are Bailey, Keeley, and Rimsen, Hicks, Lawrence, and Company. Among your acquaintances are Mr. Brown, Mr. Davis. Those in the southern trade suffer most but there is scarcely a house that does not tremble to its foundations. If foreign exchange rises in resistance of the efforts that are made to keep it down, specie payments will be inevitably suspended by every bank in the city, and probably the country ones would follow. I am not sure that the arrangement with Nick Biddle was not the best that the case admitted of for the merchants. I am certain that he could have done no better for himself. I shall try to write about these matters again before long. I am sorry to see that mischievous bill in relation to usury is so likely to pass. Without regard to the general question of its propriety, it would, as far as it had any effect, be very injurious at this time. It would merely increase the embarrassments of the borrower. On the 10th of May, 1837, and only two months after Mr. Van Buren's inauguration, the banks of New York City, with a single exception, suspended specie payments, and most of the banks of the country promptly followed their example. The legislature of New York, which was then in session, upon the recommendation of Governor Marcy, promptly passed a law legalizing the suspension. On the 13th of May, Mr. Tilden, in a letter to his father, criticized, this measure in terms calculated to inspire regret that he was not even then in a position in which his superior sagacity could have had the wider influence upon legislation to which it was entitled. 
I did not write of the financial catastrophe, because I was very much occupied, and supposed you would learn it earlier by the ordinary channel of communication. I cannot say that I am without apprehension as to the effects of the measure adopted at Albany. Common honesty and every consideration of just policy require that the bank should resume at the earliest moment possible, and it seems to me that they could do it much sooner than the time proposed. The suspension, if the banks manage with prudence, in a merely pecuniary and commercial point of view, may be beneficial, enabling them to moderate the contraction they have been forced to make with destructive rapidity and to pass by a gradual and easy transition into a wholesome state of things. I fear that the measure adopted will do mischief in giving them more latitude than is necessary, and still more in the encouragement they may derive from its leniency to continue a state of things, profitable to themselves, but truness to the public. It is contrary to reason and to experience to suppose that they will resume specie payments until they are forced to do so, or that they will voluntarily make the contraction which alone can restore the system to soundness and health. The delusive appearance of prosperity which an extension of the issues will produce may bring public opinion to sanction that extension. Individual interest will solicit it with an urgency that can scarcely be resisted, and their own interest which is advanced in proportion to the loans they can make unchecked by the convertibility of their paper, by the fear of a loss of credit, of bankruptcy, or the legal consequences of bankruptcy, will add its all-powerful influence. It is doing no injustice to them, it is but supposing them to be men, to say that an extraneous influence alone can induce them to act as the exigency requires. It is but to say what universal experience has confirmed. I have not the statistics before me as to their usual and present amount of issues, but it is my strong impression that the bill proposed allows them to extend very considerably beyond what they circulated last January, or the year before, or what they could circulate while their bills remained convertible. A general contraction sooner or later is indispensable, and to extend now a whit beyond what is unavoidable is the worst of folly. It is to lose all the beneficial results of our past sufferings, and voluntarily to inflict upon ourselves new and worse. It seems to me that, in the great diminution of liabilities by payment, the cancelling of them by bankruptcy, postponed by extension without the contraction of new ones, that a cessation from the rapid contraction that has been going on would be sufficient. If any extension be insisted on, it certainly should be slight and temporary merely to revive confidence and to moderate the inevitable contraction. I fear that the bill prepared allows much more than this, and that the banks will avail themselves of the opportunity. The idea of a resumption at a fixed time is the only restraint, and that necessity is not so unavoidable, or the consequences of resisting or evading it so alarming to them, as to be very potent. If they are imprudent, Prices, which have not fallen to a sound state, will rise, speculation revive, and a bubble will be inflated, more disastrous in its explosion than the present one. If the restriction should prove sufficient to prevent the mischief from going this length, I fear that it is not enough to prepare us to return to a natural and healthy condition, and that we may hereafter have to choose between the evils of an inconvertible paper and a reform purchased by a renewal of the suffering through which we have just passed. A permanent currency of irredeemable paper is a more intolerable curse than war, pestilence, or famine, and one to which, I hope and trust, the people will not long submit. In this letter one discerns the first symptoms of a tendency in Tilden and Marcy to operate politically on divergent lines. As time rolled on, this divergence increased, until in 1844 it resulted in a separation, and in 1848 an open war. Marcy, though a man of a high order of intellectual power, was more of a politician than a statesman. His ends the success of the party, rather than of the cause. During the summer of 1837 appeared the President's message calling for a special session of Congress in the month of September following. In his message to that body he recommended a separation of the government from the banks, 
and the establishment of the independent treasury. This measure provoked voluminous and acrimonious debate throughout the country, even before it engaged the attention of Congress. In September of that year, a series of papers appeared in the Albany Argus over the signature of Marshall, contesting the wisdom of the president's recommendations and inviting resistance to their adoption. The articles proved afterwards to have been furnished to the Argus by a clerk of the late Samuel Beardsley, an eminent lawyer and party leader of Utica, and doubtless, if not written, were inspired by him. Mr. Tilden, though still a student, sprang to the defense of the president's policy and wrote a series of papers marked by all the characteristics of his maturity and advocating the proposed separation and the redeemability of the government currency in specie. These articles were signed Crino. From the last, we make a single quotation, merely as a specimen of his style and temper in controversy at the early age of 23, but the assertion that we have more than our just proportion of the precious metals is not only erroneous in every conceivable sense, but it evinces an ignorance of the principles of currency and a vagueness of mental habits, equally astonishing. Suppose the currency of a particular country to be composed wholly of coin, and to be on a level with that of other countries, an issue of convertible paper would have the same effect in rendering it redundant as an addition of an equal amount of coin. The excess would go abroad to find a level, and the coin only having credit abroad, that would be expelled, and the paper retained. The process would continue until all the coin, for which a paper substitute of the same denomination was supplied, would be displaced. With this limitation, the amount of coin which circulates in a given country is the difference between its whole necessary currency and the paper in circulation. If a nation has a larger proportion than it desires of its currency metallic, it has only to increase the paper. If a less proportion, it has only to diminish the paper. Now, in view of these obvious principles, I ask, unless a nation has more specie than gives it a currency exclusively metallic, what possible meaning can the assertion have that it has more than its just proportion? The idea that there is an insufficiency of specie for the purposes of currency is no less intrinsically absurd. If the whole circulating medium of the world were but half its present amount, or if it were twice that amount, it would dancer its purposes nearly as well. All that is important in regard to its positive amount is that it be not so large as to become browse, or so small as not to bear subdivision. Unquestionably, a sudden change in its amount would be productive of infinite mischief. It would subvert all existing contracts by altering the standard and reference to which they were formed. But there is ample provision against this evil, so far as the precious metals are concerned. The cost of producing them is nearly invariable. They are so indestructible in their nature as to preserve the existing stock from any sudden diminution. The ordinary annual supply is constant, and is less than 1% of the amount on hand. And there is now existing, in Europe and America alone, at least 4,500 millions. So large is their amount, that for two centuries their value has suffered no sensible variation and has never been perceptibly affected by the occasional changes of particular countries from specie to paper, or from paper to specie currencies. France has twice had a currency wholly of paper, and has now returned to one almost exclusively metallic. England had a currency of inconvertible paper, and has returned to one more than half coin. To illustrate the very inconsiderable effect of even such extensive changes upon the mass of the circulating medium, it is sufficient to state a single fact. The resumption of specie payment in England created an extraordinary demand for gold of about 25 millions of dollars annually for four successive years. And although gold forms only a quarter or third part of the precious metals, the demand was met without any difficulty or sensible enhancement of its price. It is ascertained beyond the possibility of doubt that in France, with whom the commercial relations of England were most intimate, and from whom much of the supply was in fact derived, the price of gold, if affected at all, was at no time during the process enhanced to the extent of three-tenths of one percent.
Everyone at all acquainted with the subject knows that, if the object were desired, and the means judicious, coin might be substituted for the whole of our banknote circulation without raisins, a ripple upon the currency of the world. The only inconvenience of the process would be its expense, and that is not very formidable. The Secretary of the Treasury estimates the amount of currency required in this country at 110 millions, and whether we regard principle, authority, or experience, the estimate is abundantly large, allowing that we have already 75 millions of specie, 35 more would be sufficient. If we should leave in the bank 15 millions as the basis of deposits, which is quite as much as has been retained for that purpose, we must either continue in circulation an equal amount of bills, which would include those only of a very high denomination, or purchase an equal additional amount, or purchase an equal additional amount of specie. If the former, we should have to purchase 7 millions, and if the latter, 10 millions, annually for five years, or, in other words, to withdraw in each of those years an equal amount of paper, so as to determine in a favorable balance of payments, and cause an importation of specie to that amount. Whatever objections exist to the measure relate solely to its expediency, and not to its practicability. I state these facts to exhibit the real character of the worst alternative if you present an alternative by no means necessary and because I am weary of the absurd nonsense which has been so rife among certain individuals in regard to this subject. Attempting no such change, we, who have recently suffered a fluctuation in our currency of nearly 50%, ought not to be deterred from moderate reforms by the fear of disturbing the level of the precious metals to the extent of an inappreciable fraction of 1%. Marshall concluded his reply to one of Crino's communications with the following ironical argument la mad hominem, pointing unmistakably to the Honorable Lessig Cohen, then a justice of the Supreme Court of the State and a suspected author of the Crino papers. But you, Crino, do not enjoy the soft slumbers of the fat office. You are not a money lender. You hold no bonds and mortgages, no notes for monies lent. No, you have neither motive of interest nor enmity to gratify in urging the adoption of this measure. Crosswell, the editor of the Argus, used to refer occasionally with a grim smile to the bashful silence with which Judge Cohen submitted to this accusation when it was brought to his attention. In his message to Congress at the opening of the extra session in September 1837, as has already been stated, President Van Buren urged the entire separation of the financial affairs of the government from those of private individuals and corporations. To give effect to this recommendation, Senator Wright reported what was known at the time as the Independent Treasury Bill. It passed the Senate, but was defeated in the House. At the regular session of Congress in December following, Mr. Wright reported the same bill. It again passed the Senate and was laid on the table of the House by a vote of 106 to 98. The fortunes of the administration were staked upon the success of this measure. Public meetings were called all over the country for and against it, and in the fall elections for members of Congress the supreme test of the candidates of both parties was to be their attitude on this question. Nowhere was the struggle conducted with more bitterness and desperation than in the city of New York. The merchants of those days were made to believe that their former prosperity was largely due to the regulating influence of the United States Bank, and that the panics and general demoralization of the finances and business which followed the termination of its charter were the direct results of the war waged upon it by President Jackson and his successor. The industrial classes who were not borrowers nor the dependents of banks were able to look at this measure with more coolness and impartiality. It was to them, therefore, that the friends of the administration specially addressed themselves at this crisis. At a very imposing meeting of the Democratic-Republican mechanics and workingmen of the city and county of New York, held at Tammany Hall on the 6th of February, 1838, many addresses were made and 17 resolutions were adopted of a highly fulminate character against the bank, its partisans the political theories upon which its red charter was advocated, 
and recommending to the special confidence and admiration of the public hall who had supported Mr. Wright's substitute. These resolutions were prepared by Mr. Tilden. Just before the adjournment, a resolution was proposed by Mr. Thomas Carr and unanimously adopted, directing the chair to appoint a committee of 15 to draft an address from the Democratic Republican Mechanics and Trust is safer than one which relies on mere pecuniary responsibility. Men are less ready to commit a felony than incur a debt. Such are the deductions of reason. Let us test them by experience. For 50 years our mint establishment has been conducted on this system, and although it has generally involved the custody of as large an amount as need be deposited in any one sub-treasury, not a single dollar has ever been lost. Fellow citizens, we appeal to your common sense. Tell us, are your own officers less worthy of the confidence of the people than the agents of banks? Cannot the government, regulating the public funds with sole reference to security, make them as safe as banks wielding them for the purposes of gain? And what is the character of the argument by which these common sense views of the subject are opposed? Exaggerated accounts of official peculations are paraded before the public view, and for what? As arguments in favor of the system under which they occurred, and against a system under which they did not occur. In a time of peace, and with a large surplus revenue, the financial operations of the government are suddenly suspended. An extraordinary convocation of Congress is rendered necessary. The government, unable to command a dollar of its own resources, is compelled to borrow money to meet its current expenses. Under such circumstances, it is that the delinquent depositories of your revenue tell you that your future collections will not be safe, locked in your own vaults, and guarded by your own officers, but must be entrusted to them, to be loaned out to traders and speculators. We will not argue so plain a case. It would appear from the following letter, written some three weeks after the proceeding, that his father had been exercising, meantime, the inalienable, if sometimes abused, privilege of parents to criticize the performance of their offspring. Those who look back over half a century to this address may be disposed to think that Mr. Tilden wrote more about and attached far more importance than anyone else did to all the particulars of its pathogenesis. When, however, we reflect that he was writing to his father, with whom he could think aloud, that he shared this confidence with no one else, so far as there is any evidence. And when we further consider that this address was so much superior, both in thought and workmanship, to the platform mephusians to which the party had been accustomed to listen, as to cause him to be appealed to for years afterwards to frame and settle, by address or resolutions, the issues upon which, at each successive campaign, the party was to be taken into battle, we shall conclude that he in no sense exasperated the importance of the task he had undertaken. From the day he read this address until death, he never ceased to be one of the personages to whom his party turned for counsel and direction in all political emergencies. And we may add that his party rarely rejected his advice without having, sooner or later, abundant reason for regretting it. The end of chapter 3